Like Christianity is not self-help, it's self-denial. You know, it is a very dangerous time to be a Christian. Torture, beheadings, destruction the of... the highest level of persecution of Christians. A church congregation barricading themselves in from hundreds of riot police. Christians are enduring attacks for their faith like Along never with the before. savage kidnappings of Christian schoolgirls in Nigeria by Boko Haram and the burning of Christian Images churches. of violence dominate headlines. We need to make the persecuted church an issue of prayer. The Bible was written to us so that we could die to ourselves daily. All right, we're starting a new series on the book of Jude. If you got a Bible, turn to Jude. Yeah. And if you don't know where it is, it's page 1056. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's like the last, it's the book before the last book in the Bible. It's right before the book of Revelation. Um, this book has been stirring in my heart for a long time to preach on. And so we're going to do a three week series where I'm going to preach line upon line, verse by verse through the book of Jude. It's just one chapter, but it's a powerful message to the church. We're going to look at who Jude was and what was Jude's word to the church. Why was his book included in the Bible? And by the way, Jude mentions some books that aren't in the Bible. He talks about the book of Enoch. He talks about the book of Moses. We're going to get into that next week and, and answer some questions about why were certain books in the Bible, why were certain books left out of the Bible, and really what is this term that Jude really preaches on in his message about apologetics. So let, let's go with verse one. Jude introduces himself. He says, I'm Jude. I'm a bondservant of Jesus. Now, Jude was a brother to James who was a half-brother of Jesus. So they were born by Joseph and Mary. Joseph was their biological father. We know that Jesus was born divine conception to Mary. Joseph was his stepdad. Jude could have introduced himself as the half-brother of Jesus, but he doesn't even get close to that. He says, listen, I am honored to just be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That's how much Jude lived a surrendered life. As Christians, we don't, we don't come into this you know, salvation with this prideful mindset of how awesome am I. As Christians, we're called to come into this as servants to the message of Jesus. Amen. Jude introduces himself as a servant to God. When we die one day, we're not gonna step into heaven and he goes, well done, thou good and faithful millionaire. Well done, thou good and faithful you know, mom or dad. And these are great things. Well done, thou good and faithful businessman or CEO. He's gonna say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And Jude starts the message off with, listen, this, this salvation message is about serving. He says, I'm writing to everyone who's been called by God. Anybody been called by God here? He says, to those who are called and sanctified. By the way, who God calls, man cannot uncall. I'm so glad that man didn't call me into the family of God, that God called me, that God adopted me, and whom God accepts even if man rejects, God still calls you into this. He says, to those who are called and sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, may God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Now, I don't know about you, but I need more mercy every day. Jude says, I want you to know that before I get into this message, I'm praying that you would have mercy, peace in a world of chaos and strife and division and confusion. I'm praying you have peace. And he says, love. And this is important because he's going he's gonna to come in hard at the church. That we need to know that this whole message needs to be motivated from a place of love. If it's not love, it's not God. So Jude is saying, I want you to have love. I want you to have mercy. I want you to have peace. But I want you to understand what those things mean. And then he goes into verse three. He says, beloved, I wanted to write to you about salvation. I was excited to talk to you about getting saved and what that means. But now I find that there is an urgency. There's something that's stirring up in me to, to encourage you to contend for the faith, to, to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. I want to title this message, contend for the faith. Let's talk about what that word contend means. Contend means to struggle in opposition. It means to battle, to rival, to compete. This morning, I took two of our five kids with me to church. Ashley brought the other three. And the two that I brought the entire time driving to church, they're just contending with each other. It's a wrestling match in the car. We, we stopped to get coffee at a coffee shop. They get out and they're just rumbling and wrestling and contending. And this is what Jude is talking about here. He says, there is a, there is a battle going on and the battle is not with flesh and blood. 
There is a spiritual war going on. We are at war, church. Paul said in Ephesians 6, verse 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not in a wrestling match with brothers and sisters or political ideologies. This is not a cultural war. There is a spiritual war going on for the church. And this spiritual war is at the front doorstep of your house, your apartment, your dorm room. There is a spiritual war for your soul and for the souls that are connected to you. Jude says, I felt an earnest, urgent desire to challenge you to contend for this faith, contend, to fight for this, to defend it. So apologetics basically just means defending the faith. The Greek word for uh, apologia means a defense, like a lawyer at, at a trial, defending someone. In every generation, we're facing challenges, questions, and concerns about the gospel message of the Christian faith, and we have a calling to contend for the faith. Paul says there is a battle, there is a war. What is this war with? So Jude goes on to say in verse four, he says, I say these things because certain men have crept in unnoticed. Now this is important. And I, I wanna look at the New Living Translation. He says, certain men have wormed their way into your churches. Certain wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. I saw a picture of a wolf amongst sheep and I couldn't get the picture out of my mind. I wanna just throw it up on the screen because this wolf was standing with sheep all around it and he was blending in. And the devil is a really good liar. The devil is a really good con man. The devil knows how to dress something up to look like it's okay and to worm. Jude says there are, there are people who have wormed their way into the church and they are twisting the gospel message. And they are distorting and deceiving many people and pulling them away from the truth of God's word. He said, I, I feel an urgency to challenge the church to stand for the faith in Jesus Christ that was given to you. He says, there is a deception going on. When I think about deception and I think about the con man, I think about people throughout history who conned their way into people's lives. And it's very deceiving, like deception is very deceiving. Sometimes you can't see it. People said Ted Bundy, who went on to become one of the most notorious serial killers of his time, they said when, when they first met him, he was sweet, he was nice. He was the guy that everybody could trust. And yet he had this deep, dark deceptiveness that he was pulling people into. And that's how the devil works. He, he works his way in and he begins to deceive. And so I think there's a deception that has come into the church that has tried to pull people away. What is real Christianity? Christianity is about following Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone wants to be known as my disciple, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow after me. I was at uh, our boys' basketball game this past week, which shout out to the boys' and girls' victory basketball teams. They did so good this year. So good. And as a fan, growing up, I loved being a fan for sports. I still do. I'm, I'm one of the loudest fans. Where I go, I just want to shout, I want to scream, I want to stand, I want to yell at the refs. I'm, I'm passionate about cheering on a team. I used to be a part of a fan club at ORU when I was a student there, and we were called the Maybe Maniacs. Yeah. We would paint our bellies, we would paint our faces, we would show up 30 minutes before the game, we stirred, we stood the whole time, we shouted, we studied the opponents, we would shout things about them when they were on the free throw line to try to distract them, we'd shout their girlfriend's names. So we, like, we, were, we were fans, we were fans. We knew about these players, but we didn't know these players. It's one thing to know about Jesus, to know about the Bible, it's another thing to actually know him. Jesus said, there will be many at the end of the ages who say, we went to church, we prayed in your name, we prophesied in your name. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Jesus is not interested in building a fan base, he's interested in inviting followers who are willing to deny themselves and come after him. But, but in America and in other places, not just America, there has been a deceptive Christianity that has crept in that has twisted what this thing is about. It's almost like people have been sold this Christian message that this is about you, about you getting what you want, you getting more of yourself, like self-help, self-growth, self-gratification, self-glorification, self, self, self. This is not about us, this is about Jesus. 
Christianity is not about making you greater. It's about making him greater. It's about dying daily. It's about taking up your cross and following after Jesus. But people have lost this in some places. And I started writing down this deception that has come into the church because I think sometimes we don't see it. We don't know how to spot it. So I just wrote down some signs of deception that have crept into Christianity. One of the first signs is this idea of don't offend anybody with the truth. Pastor Paul, don't offend anybody. I brought people here today. Just be politically correct. Don't say anything that would offend them. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. We're living in a time where people don't want the truth. Tell me what I want to hear. Don't tell me what I need to hear. Tell me what makes my ears tickle. Tell me what makes me feel good. So I brought a Dr. Pepper with me up on stage. Um, Anybody like Dr. Pepper? I love Dr. Pepper. If I cover the top of this where it says how many calories are in this, I could just look at total fat, zero grams. I'm like, yes, zero grams. This is great. This is healthy for me. Um, Protein, zero grams. Okay, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, (laughs) Sodium, 55 milligrams. Uh, Total sugars. There's only 39 grams of total sugars. There's also 150 calories here. But as I start reading what's in Dr. Pepper, there's this word that stands out to me, artificial flavors. This This is artificial. And I think there's some people who are living in an artificial Christianity. And we pick and choose what we like. Fast food Christianity, DoorDash Christianity. Uh, it's like, I want what I want, and, and if I don't get what I want, when I want it, I'm not leaving a tip. I'll take the burger, no lettuce, no tomatoes, no vegetables. I'll take the benefits of Christianity without commitment to Jesus. I want the blessings of God without boundaries in my life. I, I want God to do miracles for me, but I don't want to have to surrender anything to Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died trying to take down Hitler in World War II, who was a Christian and a martyr, who was trying to uh, save Jewish people from the Holocaust, he wrote down in his memoirs, he said this, a time is coming where cheap grace will become the preaching of our day. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring any repentance. It's giving baptism without church discipleship. It's offering communion without confession to Christ. It's absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without any discipline. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus. Grace without without the presence and the power of God. The Salvation Army founder, William Booth, he warned about the time that we were heading into that a different gospel would begin to grow rampant in America. He said the chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, heaven without hell. People are trying to erase hell, trying to erase anything that would make anyone feel uncomfortable. Don't offend anybody. Signs of deception. One of the second signs is people are being told, follow your heart. If it feels good to you, it's okay. Moral relativism. What, like whatever, whatever your truth is, is your truth, and if that's your truth, that's your truth, and I don't want to challenge that because that's your truth. If If your heart's telling you to do this, do it. Even if it hurts other people, as long as it's okay for you, it's okay. That's not Christianity. The third sign of deception is whatever works for you, you do you. You do you, boo. No, you don't do you, boo. Like, do what the Holy Spirit and what Jesus is calling us to do. There's a, there's a, uh, a, a deception out there that says there's no absolutes. There's no right or wrong. There is no absolute truth. That, 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 that no one has the, the market on what's true and what's not true. There's a challenge to deconstruct truth altogether. There's a, a deception that's crept into the church of teaching people that the Bible is not inspired by God, that man just came up with these ideas, these stories. It was some good journal writings. There's some good you know, quotes out there that we can post on our social media to live a pretty good life, but it's not really inspired by God. That's antichrist. It's not biblical. And people who go down that path, by the way, it doesn't lead to a more fulfilling, healed, whole life. It leads to a narcissistic life because we start thinking that we are the gods of our life. There's a a teaching in Christianity of just everything's about me, 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 whatever I want, however I want it. 
Proverbs says, whoever trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks in the wisdom of God will be delivered from trouble. Jeremiah, one of the prophets that God used to preach in his time, he says, he who trusts in his heart is foolish. The heart is deceitful above all else. Now, this was, this was a mighty prophet who preached with the inspiration and power of God, and he said, even I am, am capable of walking into self-deception. The greatest people in the church, the people who follow Jesus the longest, including me on this stage, anyone in this room who's followed Jesus for a long time, we are all capable of being self-deceived. This is why we should not follow our heart. We should follow Jesus. We don't follow our feelings just because our feelings tell us something. I wanna pray for a man that I just heard on the news just 15 minutes ago, right before I came into service, a man who's standing on the bridge at 71st and Lewis right now, contemplating taking his life. They shut down the bridge to try to save this man. Y'all, let me just say this before we pray for him. Our feelings lie to us. Our feelings tell us to end our life. Our feelings tell us to walk away from things that God's called us to stay in. Our feelings are not a good compass to follow. Lord, I pray for the man right now on the bridge. I pray that you would rescue his life from the clutches of hell. I pray that he would wake up to the truth above his feelings that God, you have a purpose for his life and you are redeeming him right now. You are pulling him out of that pit of despair and suicide and depression in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Our prayers are powerful, church. Our prayers are powerful. There's a teaching that we can be perfect and that we've arrived and we will never sin nor have any need of repentance for the rest of our lives. John Bevere preached a great message last week talking about the power of sanctification. That word sanctification just means the ongoing process of God making us holy and making us more like Jesus through renewing our hearts and our minds and continuing to purify us because we need to be purified by God on a regular basis. I don't know about you, but I am not perfect. Anyone else in this room not perfect? Anyone still need mercy? Aren't you thankful the mercies of God are new every morning? So this idea that we don't need to repent, we don't need to grow, we don't need to change, we don't need to become better. I love my kids for who they are right now. I love them. We got a 10-year-old, 8-year-old, 5-year-old, 4-year-old, and a 2-year-old. Pray for us. But they're amazing. I love them for who they are. But if I looked at our 4-year-old and I said, Ellie, you're incredible. I love you just the way you are. Don't ever change. Stay this way forever. If Ellie was still acting like a 4-year-old when she's 40 years old, I would go, Ellie, it's time to grow up. I love you, but you need to mature. You need to stop, you know, sucking on the thumb. You need to stop, uh, like, you, you need to stop throwing fits when things don't go your way. And in the same way, God comes to us as believers and says, listen, I love you. I'll always love you, but I want you to mature. I want you to grow, Paul. I want you to repent. I want you to change. I want you to get things right in your life. That's God's love. It leads us, his kindness leads us to repentance. And then the last deception that I'll hit on, and then we'll go into the rest of Jude here, is people are, are teaching this message that all roads lead to heaven, that there is no hell, that nobody's going to hell, that we're all gonna end up in heaven someday. That's wrong. Jesus is the only way. He's the truth and the life. Wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path that leads to heaven. Jesus is the only way to the Father. I'm so thankful that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. No amount of good works can save us. No amount of good deeds. You aren't saved by Buddha. You aren't saved by Hare Krishna. You aren't saved by being a good person. You aren't saved because your parents are saved. You're saved because you confessed Jesus with your mouth, believed in your heart that he rose from the grave and your name is written in the book of life. So let's talk about why people have drifted. There's a group of people right now who call themselves the new vegetarians. It's true. Basically, they call themselves new vegetarians or flexitarians is the other name. And they're basically, they only eat meat when they want to. The rest of the time they eat vegetables. So as long as they don't want to eat meat, they don't eat meat, they are the new veg. I think I'm a new vegetarian, I guess, because I only eat meat pretty much when I want to. And, and there's people that are living like this in church. I live for Jesus when I want to. I'm a flexitarian Christian. I follow Jesus when it's convenient, when it's comfortable. If it costs me something, I'm out. If I got to stay longer than an hour in church, I'm out. If I gotta worship with my hands up, if I gotta give in the offering, if I've gotta 
sacrifice in any way, I'm out. I'm a flexitarian Christian. I'm in this for the benefits. I'm in this for the convenience. I'm in this for the community. And Jesus says, you want to follow me? You got to deny yourself. People who live with truth and no grace end up in a a, a ditch of legalism. So it's rules, rules, rules. It's like, no makeup, no lipstick, no movies, no, like nothing. It's, it's extremely intense. There's people in this room who you grew up in a very legalistic house because there was no grace. It was all truth and it was all law, law, law. But then people can swing. Like I remember in school one time I was walking down the hallway and I didn't have my shirt tail tucked in and the teacher was like, shirt tail's untucked? That is wrong. And I translated that as like, I need to go down to the altar. I need to get saved again because I untucked my shirt. And I I got angry about that. And what happens is some people get angry over the rules in a church or Christian school, like these kinds of things. And they'll go to this other side of the pendulum. They'll go live a life of grace without truth. So there's the ditch of truth without grace, but then this ditch of grace without truth. And this is greasy grace. This is no boundaries, no rules, no, like I'm gonna do what I wanna do because the grace of God is my license to sin. No. The grace of God is the unmerited kindness and compassion of God, but it is the empowerment to win against sin and what my flesh craves. Paul the apostle who was once Saul of Tarsus was very legalistic, he was all about the law. And then he gets knocked off his high horse and he gets introduced to the grace of God. But instead of going into a life of just total like sin and doing whatever his flesh wanted to do, he found this balance of truth and grace. How do we know what truth and grace is? Grace without truth leads to chaos. Truth without grace leads to a mean-spirited, legalistic Pharisee. We need both. Grace can lead us into the change that God wants to bring in our lives if we will accept truth with grace. Here's what happened. When a woman was caught in the act of adultery in John chapter eight, she had cheated on her husband uh, with another man and the, the church people picked up their stones and they're like, we're gonna stone this woman for her sin. Jesus doesn't grab a stone. He gets right in the dust with a woman. This is how Jesus treats sinners. By the way, how should we punish sinners? We shouldn't. We should go right to Jesus and pray for every person, including ourselves, when we're caught in sin, that the mercy of God would meet us there, deliver us from sin, and that grace would lead us into life change. So Jesus gets right there. He starts writing in the sand. He doesn't announce this woman's life to everybody. He doesn't talk about it to everybody. He just writes in the sand. The woman's crying. And then he looks at the guys who are holding these rocks. And he says, hey, you with no sin, you cast the first stone at this woman. The oldest guys who know they've sinned start dropping their stones all the way down to the youngest Pharisee. Some believe that Paul, who was once Saul, was one of those young guys that was there dropping a stone. And then Jesus looks at the woman. By the way, compassion doesn't mean condoning. He doesn't affirm her decision. He doesn't say, hey, that was a good decision. Keep doing that. No. He looks at her. He says, where are your accusers? And she says, there's none. He says, neither do I condemn you. I don't condemn you, but I don't condone what you did. He says, go and sin no more. His grace opened the door for truth. Grace opens the door for a lot of change when we accept what Jesus wants us to live like. Isaiah the prophet, he says, woe to those who call evil good. Woe to those who condone sin. Murder is still murder, no matter how you dress it up in America today or whatever political ideas you have. We are in a spiritual war. And what's happening is people are trying to condone and affirm and twist the grace of God to match a political correct Christianity. Jesus was not politically correct. Jesus was a rebel in his time. Jesus was rowdy. Jesus brought the truth. And he brought the truth with grace. The biggest threat to the church today are people who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close to Jesus to get the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. So as we close today, I want you to imagine that Jesus is meeting you at a restaurant right after service, Texas Roadhouse. The rolls are already at the table. You can smell them. The honey butter is there. He's already ordered you a steak. 
Jesus wants to have a, a conversation with you and just you, not your whole family and all your friends, just you. He's like, date, you and me. All right, so Jesus is sitting there and you sit down and you're like, what's up, Jesus? You're grabbing the rolls, you're eating the honey butter. You're like, this is so good. I love you, Jesus. And he says, um, can we talk about our, our relationship? He wants to have a DTR. He wants to def- define the relationship. And you're like, uh, what are you talking about? I went to church today. That's how our relationship is going. I went to church today. Are you proud of me? I went to church today. Jesus is like, that's great. That's great. I just want to know. And imagine Jesus is talking to you across the table. He's like, I just want to know, where are we going? What, what would you call this relationship? How far do you want to go in this relationship? By the way, the book of Jude, this guy who called himself a servant of Christ, he died a martyr's death. He was in it till death do him part and into eternity. The reward for Jude was not a bigger house and a nicer car and all his prayers answered and the Dallas Cowboys win the Super Bowl and as long as everything's going good, he'll be at church. Jude was in this completely for the honor of following Jesus. So Jesus looks at you and he says, what are you in this for? And how long are you in this for? And at what point do you turn around and walk away? At what point do you leave because you're bored or the series wasn't for you or the message didn't make you better? At what point do you say, I'm here because I've decided to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. I saw this video years ago. I woke up one morning and I heard about these Christians who had been kidnapped by ISIS terrorists and they were brought outside of their church on the beaches of Egypt And they begin to ask each Christian, will you denounce Jesus so you can live? If you denounce Jesus, we will let you live. You can have your job, you can have your money, you can have your house, you can have all the comforts of this world. All you have to do is deny Jesus. And one by one, each of these Christians begin to shout, Jesus, forgive them. And they begin to shout this prayer as they wept. And the terrorist ISIS soldiers begin to shout, Allah! And they begin to shout their terrorist chants as they begin to chop off each of these Christians' heads. And I remember hearing about it in the news and I was like, oh no, this is terrible, this is so bad. And then Jesus asked me something in that moment. I felt him in my heart asking me, Paul, what would you say? What would you do? What would the American church do? Yeah. That's good. How far will you follow Jesus? I want you to watch this video as we get ready to close out. It is a very dangerous time to be a Christian. Torture, beheadings, destruction of... The highest level of persecution of Christians. A church congregation barricading themselves in from hundreds of riot police. Christians are enduring attacks for their faith like never before. Along with the savage kidnappings of Christian schoolgirls in Nigeria by Boko Haram and the burning of images of violence dominate headlines. Christians are being warned they have a choice. Convert to Islam, pay a very steep price, or face death. Chilling new video showing the beheading of 21 Egyptian Christians. Beheadings of 21 Christians. 21 Christian men beheaded by Islamic State. The title of the video is a message signed with blood to the nation of the cross. The the sharpest jump in violent uh, attacks against Christians. We need to make the persecuted church an issue of prayer. names. These are the 21 men who decided that day that they would rather step into eternity. They would rather lose their life to follow Jesus than gain the whole world and lose their soul. 
God is calling the church to a greater level of surrender. And I want to just finish with these last few thoughts. What does it look like to contend for the faith? Real faith requires real surrender. Real faith requires real surrender. Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. The call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is the dying of the old man, which is the result of his encounter with Jesus. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Jesus. We give over our rights for everything. Jim Elliott, who gave his life for the Aka Indians in Ecuador, he said, I don't seek a long life. I seek a full life, a life lived for Jesus. Lord, I want to burn for you. Consume my life, God, for it is not my life. It is yours. Real faith requires real surrender. Number two, there will be persecution. We got to understand that persecution has already began in America. There is an attack on Christian faith right now to compromise our beliefs, to fit a political narrative that feels good from the White House. The White House does not determine the Christian faith of Victory Church. Jesus determines the Christian faith of this church. I don't care what popular preachers say, what popular politicians say, we're gonna follow Jesus. He is our king, he is our author, he is the finisher of our faith, he is the pioneer of our faith. Revelation says, I know that you are enduring patiently. You are bearing under persecution for my name's sake and that you have not grown weary. Galatians says, do not grow weary. Do not grow weary. Mark says, you will be hated by everyone. The, the more you follow Jesus, the more people will hate you. But endure. Those who endure to the end will be saved. Remember those who are being persecuted for their faith right now. I remember going to China on a mission trip, and we got to meet with a 91-year-old man who had spent 30 years in prison for sharing the gospel, and he had a huge smile on his face, and there was a translator, and he would speak in Chinese, and the translator would tell us in English what he was saying, but he began to say, it was my honor to spend those 30 years in prison for sharing the gospel and smuggling Bibles into China and giving my life for the gospel. And I'm crying listening to him. And I'm like, would I do that? Would I do that? And would I live with that honor? Because American Christianity has drifted into this, what is in it for me? And if the preacher's not talking something that helps me, 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 then I don't want to listen. But real Christianity is about Jesus. It's 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 about Jesus. And our nation needs churches that are rising up with a passion for Jesus. A passion to make Jesus known in the streets. This is why we're doing this Easter production. We're not doing it to entertain believers. We're doing it to reach the lost. We're doing it to get people in these doors that need hope. They need the presence of God. Every empty seat has a name on it. Someone needs this church. There are people in our city that we walk by every day. And we're afraid to offend them. I'm afraid to ask if they go to church. I'm afraid to ask if they need prayer. We need to break that spirit of fear. And we need to say there is a harvest of souls in our city that need Jesus. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. We need Jesus. I remember when the Columbine shooting happened and I saw on the news these teenagers who stood for Jesus as shooters walked into their school in Colorado and said, do you believe in Jesus? And a girl said yes. And the shooter said, go meet your king. Go meet your savior. And she stood for Jesus. There was a man by the name of James Calvert who was sent to be a missionary to the cannibals of the Fiji Islands, and the captain of the ship who was dropping off James and his other missionary friends, he said, you know you're going to die when you get off this boat. You're going to lose your life and the lives of everyone with you. You're responsible for their deaths. And to that, James replied to the captain, we died before we ever got on the boat. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Number three, to contend for the faith, we must pray. We must pray for the gospel to advance. Jesus said, pray 
for the harvest, that the Lord of the harvest would send out more laborers into the field. Pray that God would raise up more people with a missions mindset, more people to reach the people of Tulsa who are far from God, reach the people of Florida, reach the people of Greece, reach the people of El Salvador, reach the people of China. Pray that the gospel would go forth and pray as the gospel goes forth. Paul said, pray that there would be open doors and protection, that that evil schemes and wicked people who are trying to mess with the message, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. This month, we need to pray for our missions teams while they're overseas ministering. We need to pray for their bus rides, their airplane trips. We need to pray where they're staying. We need to pray as they go into schools that they have favor with mayors and governors and teachers and principals. We need to pray that God opens the door for the gospel to advance. I remember hearing this story about a missionary from Congo, Africa. And I promise I'll dismiss in just a few minutes, but, but can you guys hang for just like a few more minutes? This missionary from Congo, Africa, he, um, he came home to his church in Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, for two weeks, and he came to report what God had been doing in Congo. And he stood up in church on a Sunday, and he started sharing how just two months ago in January, he said, I was traveling from one village to another village, and I had a backpack of cash and medicine, and I was going to deliver help to some people that needed it two week, uh, that were several, several villages away from us, and it was going to take two days to travel through the jungle. He said, when I was there, there were two guys in a fight, and one man was left really bloody, so I knelt down, and I bandaged his wounds, took care of him, and then he said, I traveled another mile into the jungle, and I camped out that night. He said, I made it to the village, and I delivered the medicine, prayed with people, led people to Christ, went back, and he said, on my way back, that man who I had helped stopped me. And he said, several nights ago, you, you stopped and you helped bandage me. He said, yes, I remember you. He said, that same night, I looked at your backpack. I saw all the cash you were carrying and the medicine. And he said, I went and got a couple of my buddies and we followed you to your campsite. We were gonna murder you that night. We were gonna steal all your cash and all your medicine. He said, right as we were coming close to your tent, 26 armed guards surrounded your tent in front of us, and they were huge. He said, me and my buddy started counting them, 26 armed guards, and the missionary goes, no, I was all alone. I was all alone. I was by myself that night. As this missionary is telling this story in Michigan, a congregation member interrupts him in the middle of his message. He says, hey, what night was that? The missionary was startled. He was like, "Uh, it was January 14th. And the congregation member, he said, we had 26 men in the prayer room that same night praying for you because we felt like there was something attacking you. We started praying. Y'all, prayer is powerful. 26 men in the prayer room, 26 armed guards surrounding. Don't tell me prayer doesn't work. We need to pray. Number four, we need to sow. We need to sow. Any church that's not seriously involved in helping the Great Commission has forfeited its biblical right to exist. Jesus did not suggest that we go into all the world and preach the gospel. He commanded us, make disciples, not just of your hometown, but every tribe, every tongue. We gotta share the gospel. Why is Victory so passionate about sending out missionaries? Because Jesus called us to. It's not because it's a cool idea. It's not because some other church, it's because Jesus said to do it, so we do what Jesus said. Jim Elliott, who gave his life for the Aka Indians, he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Keith Green said, this generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of souls on the earth. And number five, here it is right here, share the gospel. Go share the gospel. I'm I'm praying that every single one of you in this room gets to go on an outreach with us at the Tulsa Dream Center. I see Tim Newton sitting on the front row. He's our director of the Dream Center. We have outreaches this upcoming Saturday at the West Tulsa Dream Center. We have outreaches at the North Tulsa Dream Center. We have outreaches where you can go and serve in our city and share the gospel, minister to people, bring groceries, bring the gospel, bring help to people. But I also pray you get to go on missions one day. How many of y'all would like to one day go on a missions trip with Victory to another country to share the gospel or another city or another state? Yeah. Y'all, when there's hurricanes, when there's disasters, guess who's gonna show up? Victory. We're gonna send out teams of you to go and minister to people, whether it's in Alabama or Arkansas or Oklahoma or Tennessee or Madagascar or Myanmar. If there's, uh, if there's, recently we, we, we sent a team uh, to go and minister in in the panhandle of Texas where the wildfires started to spread. 
Why? Because missions is not just something we do overseas. It's what we do in our backyard. It's what we do in our own state. It's what we do in our nation. And I believe God wants you to be a part of this. As we close out today, let me just say this quote here. Hudson Taylor, who gave his life for China, he said, if I had a thousand lives to live, I would give every life for China. Lost people matter to God, so lost people matter to us. Every empty seat in this room has someone's name on it for Easter. I'm praying that every seat would be filled with someone who feels far from God, who feels hopeless, who's thinking about jumping off a bridge, who's not sure if God could save their marriage, who's not sure if God has a purpose for their life. I'm praying for every businessman downtown who's walked away from God, every businesswoman who's forgotten that Jesus loves her. I'm praying for for the high and the low, the rich and the poor, the down and out and the up and in, to show up on Easter week and get saved because you invited them. You shared the gospel. Robert Moffat said, in the vast plains of Africa, I have sometimes seen in the morning sun the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary has ever been and no one has ever shared the gospel. David Livingstone read that and he was inspired to give his life for Africa. He said, sympathy is no substitute for action. It's not enough to feel bad for Africa. We've got to go to Africa. He said, if a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? I want us to stand to our feet all over this place. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would give us the courage to contend for the faith, to contend against personal feelings of doubt and deception and confusion and and just settling for what feels good and what our heart wants to do and to really contend to say, Jesus, I want to live for you. I want to give my life for you. I I want my life to count for a purpose beyond just me. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray for anyone in the room today who says this message was for me. There are some areas in my life that I need to surrender and I need to let the Holy Spirit really take over. And I want to live with a greater fervency and passion to know Jesus, to really have a relationship with Jesus and to make him known in my lifetime. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand up all over this room. Yeah, God's talking to you, 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 all from the front to the back. You're saying, this was for me. The Holy Spirit was convicting me through this mess. There's some things that I need to surrender. There's some areas that I need to get right. Maybe you didn't even realize that there's some self-deception that's crept in and you go, I just need to, I, I want God to take over my mind, my heart, my life. Secondly, you're here today and you say, I'm not right with Jesus. I need to get saved. I need to repent of my sins and let Jesus be Lord of my life. Raise your hand. Today's your day. Salvation is here. Come on, hands going up around the room. The angels in heaven are rejoicing over one sinner who repents and says, I need Jesus. And lastly, I want to invite anyone down to the altar today that you just feel a call to get involved in missions and outreach, to one day go on a missions trip. Maybe for those who are going on missions, you just feel a call to live with a greater boldness and passion. I think there's some Judes in the room. We're we're focusing on the book of Jude this month. Jude was a man who decided, I don't wanna just be related to Jesus, my family. I don't wanna just know about Jesus. I don't wanna just be a fan. I wanna really follow Jesus with passion. I want to use my life as a missionary in my own city, as a person who lives with the mindset that I'm here to serve Jesus. I just want to pray for anyone in the room that feels a greater calling and urgency to live with that missional mindset, to contend for the faith. If you raised your hands or you wanted to raise your hands, I want you to leave your seat. Meet me at the altar. We're going to cheer on brave men, brave women, brave young guys, young girls, moms, dads, teenagers, grandparents, whatever generation you're in. This is a a, a day of celebration. This is a day of surrender. This is a day where you say, I am not living a life for myself. I want to live for Jesus. I want to burn for Jesus. I want the Holy Spirit to lead me, to guide me. Maybe you've never allowed the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be active in your life. Maybe you're here today and you say, I always thought talking in tongues was weird and it wasn't for me and it was for other people. Maybe you're here today and you go, I just, I want the Holy Spirit to be real in my life. I want Jesus to be real in my life. I want to really follow after him. I don't want to just be a fan. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Let's just worship. Let's just surrender right now. Take just a minute. And let's just sing this to the Lord. You can have it all, Lord. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name.
Lord, I thank you, God, for your mercy, your grace, your truth, your purpose, God, your power, the demonstration of the gospel. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, God, leading us, guiding us, stirring us, God, to live with passion, to live with your compassion, grace and truth, grace and truth. He loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He is for you. He is with you. He has not forsaken you. He has not abandoned you. God is not finished with your story. God is not finished with your testimony. You're going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony. Lord, I pray for greater passion, greater fire. Holy Spirit. God loves you so much. God has a great purpose for your life. The devil has tried to come against so many of you in this room with discouragement, with distractions, with fear, with even feelings of inadequacy, insecurity, questioning who am I for God to use me. And God says, you are the perfect candidate for the mercy and grace of God to flow to and to flow through. God says, I'm going to use your testimony, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's going to save a lot of people because of your boldness to step forward and share the gospel. God says, I'm not looking for perfect people. I'm looking for broken people, surrendered people, people who know they need God's mercy and grace, people who know that that, that, that without Jesus, where would I be? God says, that amazing grace is going to give you the power to overcome sin and discouragement and fear and inadequacy and insecurity. I just hear God saying, I'm raising up a new generation of missionaries. I'm raising up a new generation of evangelists. The victory will be the the soil that sends out so many people to the nations of the world. God, I thank you that we would come back to the heart of worship, that it's not about us. It was never about us. It's always been about you. And God, I thank you, Lord, that you'll take care of our needs. I pray for every person in the room who wants to step out one day and go on a mission trip, do outreach, do ministry, but they don't know how. They don't know where the provision will come from or how it's going to happen. I thank you, Lord, that you're faithful. Where you guide, you provide. Where you direct, you protect. Lord, I pray for every person in the room that needs more of just your power in their life. And they have felt weak and they've felt just overwhelmed by the worries and cares and burdens of life. God, that as they wait upon you, God, you said you would renew our strength. I pray for a renewal of strength and the Holy Spirit power in Jesus' name. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender. I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the grave. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sin, and I receive your forgiveness. I receive your salvation. Holy Spirit, guide me into all truth. No more deception. No more lies of the enemy. I will live for Jesus. I will contend for the faith. Give me boldness, Lord. 
to stand, to share your truth with grace. I'm all yours, God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.